Okay, Boker Tov, everybody. Hope everybody's well. I, I think this is actually part 19 of this series. It's a little bit hard to believe, and we're still on, on the sitter, and we're still uh, not even at Rabbi Yishmael Omer. So, my gosh. But uh, anyways, uh, I hope uh, the slow pace, uh, there's a lot to discuss. And, of course, the sitters are, are jumping board or to, you know, so a discussion of so many other things. And as we really discussed in our first class, the sitter really contains everything. The sitter is learning and uh, med- a- 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 every sort of genre of Jewish life, poetry and, uh, you know, Mishnah, Talmud, um, Tehillim. I mean, y- y- you name it. Uh, everything is singing, songs. I mean, weddings, funerals. Everything is found in, in the sitter. The sitter is the order of life and not just the order of prayer. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to finish. Maybe, hopefully, by day we'll get, get close to Rabbi Shmuel Um Okay, so we're, uh, we got to, you know, Pamayim Bechol Yom, the the Olam Yehei Adam, Yerei Shemaim, right, this added in Tfilah, that was because the Jews were not allowed to say Shema in the shul, so they had to say this at home, but say there quietly, and then uh, we come, and then we we end up that how how blessed were we spoke last week, how wonderful it is to be Jewish, and how what a, what a pride and privilege, and that's what Ashrei, it's Naim and Yafe and Tov and our our Goraleinu, our Lot and our Yerushatenu, our, our inheritance. All it's a beautiful way of life. Uh, we don't always make it beautiful, and of course, obviously, um, sometimes there are outside forces that uh, that uh, make being a Jew not so simple or, or pleasurable. But uh, but the the essence of Judaism is a joy and a wonder, and uh, thank God that like said, we live probably in the greatest generation, at least since probably the time of, of David Shlomo. The, the, despite all the problems we have in the world, it's, it's hard to think of a better time and a, uh, to be a Jew than it is it's today where Jews are so successful and really have freedoms uh, unimagined, uh, even in the golden age of, of Spain. The golden age of Spain was relatively the golden age of Spain. If we had the golden age of Spain today, boy, we would be suing left and right discrimination as it was. The Jews were discriminated against. They just were weren't weren't persecuted. They weren't uh, they weren't killed. They, they, you know, so that's the golden age of Spain. Yeah, and they they interacted, but it's nowhere near like we have today. Anyway, so we got to uh, we were we're we're blessed that we can say the Shema, and then we said in small print, right? Bahapta, for if you're running late. This is the time you're supposed to say Shema. We're so assimilated, we'll, we'll get there. Yes, that, that's the price of freedom is the ability to assimilate, okay? Um, I would much prefer Jews assimilate than they're persecuted. What, what can I tell you? You know, physical freedom is good. Assimilation isn't good, but in a sense, assimilation is, I, I don't want to say it's our fault, but it's our challenge. In other words, uh, don't blame the Jews who are assimilated. Like, as we're going to discuss, it's actually great because we're talking now on Kiddush Hashem. Do we sanctify God's name? That other people would want to be observing. That's exactly what we're gonna we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. So uh, you're right. There's a what what can we say? But it's still a wonderful time to be Jewish. It doesn't mean there are not many many uh, many problems. Okay. So um, but uh, okay, we'll get there hopefully a little bit more. Um, where are we in the Siddur? I'm sorry, we're at Shema Yisrael. That's an, in the Quran, that's the meaning of this. Here we have Siddur, page 39. You know, after Birchat Hashakal Olam Yedam Yerei Shemaim Vesetir Ubegalui, we said that whole paragraph after, you know, the 15 Brachot Hanoten Nesach Bivin Alafim Ben Yulayla. It's a couple pages later. And we're now going to, we started last week, the paragraph Atel Meshul Nibra Olam. We talked about God is about time. And we talked about the sort of the funny, uh, idea that this Shema, we say this here, Shema, so we said a, a, a particular time, and of course God is a, a buff time. And then this bracha was about sanctifying the name of God. So we started last week, that's what we'll pick up on, um, that, that Kiddush Hashem is the first it's the first thing we say here now in the morning. We say it early in the morning. And then we're, it's the first, it's the way the Rambam begins his code of, um, of Jewish law. So why don't we begin there? We discussed last week uh, we, that the first four chapters, just let me share my screen here. Uh, the first four chapters of, um, of the Mishnah Torah um, are metaphysics and all the things they put the Rambam and Techerim for, and, you know, Gemara is not so important. Uh, it's more important to study philosophy and, uh, you know, etc. So, okay, that's just a totally aside, but it's really fascinating. The Rambam begins 
the real mission of Torah that we know, and, and it was the four chapters, the first four chapters they burned. The, the mission of Torah as the summary of the 613 mitzvot, and that's what it is. I mentioned I it's called the Mishnah Torah. Uh, this, the second Torah, the repetition of the Torah, the, uh, the Mishnah Torah is basically an explanation of the um, 613 mitzvot. So how does the Rambam begin? The Rambam begins the fifth chapter. Why is it? Uh, uh, chapter, where are we going here? Okay, chapter five. Kol Beit Yisrael Metzuvim Al Kiddush Hashem. It's an it's a it's a beautiful expression. Kol Beit Yisrael. What does Kol Beit Yisrael mean? The entire house of Israel. Why doesn't he just say uh, uh, you know Metzuvim Al Bnei Yisrael Metzuvim? What what is he adding when he says Kol Beit Yisrael Metzuvim Yeah, so he's adding women for for sure. He's adding women. He's adding men, women, children. He's adding uh, everybody is. It's obvious. And it's also, it's, it's a sort of a beautiful, welcoming expression. I think I mentioned last week when the Rambam wants to refer to non-Jews. And it, what's the expression the Rambam uses when he refers to non-Jews? So there the Rambam says, Kol ba'e olam, all those who come to the world, Kol ba'e olam. And the Rambam, actually, when he talked, the, the, um, the only justification for kolel that we have in the Rambam the Rambam, as I'm sure many of you know, is uh, to say he's anti kola would be an understatement. The Rambam says that one who takes money for the study of Torah, I guess that would include me because, you know, I, I teach, I get paid, um, loses their share in the world to come. Uh, the Rambam did not at all. He's the most, uh, to say he's extreme, he's the, he's the extremist here. The Rambam usually believes in the golden mean, in moderation. But here the Rambam really, really... Um, does not at all like it. I can maybe show you a little bit. Hello. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No. So the the Rambam is very much against taking any form of payment, and that's why the Rambam became a doctor. If your family member wants to give you, that's okay. His brother used to support him, and when his brother unfortunately drowned in an accident, the Rambam had to make a, a living. He, uh, he couldn't, so he decided to, to go to medical school. I assume he had an interest in medicine before. I don't think it's that's like, okay, I'll, I'll go to medical school to make a, make a, a living. But the, the Rambam was, ve was vehemently opposed to taking any money for the study of Torah. And uh, everybody says, we don't follow this Rambam. It's uh, whatever, Beseder, okay. Um, it's, it's impossible. Even if the Rambam is right, so it's like writing down the Mishnah. You know, you're not allowed to write down the Mishnah. We're not allowed to have a Gemara. You can't learn Dafyomi. It's prohibited. There's a biblical prohibition to learn Dafyomi. Uh, we'll read it in the next, in two weeks, Parsha. Kielpi Advarimela. When the God says, write down this Kielpi, that most of the Torah is oral Torah. So it's forbidden. Everybody knows that. It's forbidden to write the Mishnah. It's forbidden to learn Dafyomi. It's a, it's a violation of Torah law. So why do people learn Dafyomi? So either they're not so religious, so I assume people don't think that. So we assume that the Rabbi Huda Hanasi said it's we have in our traditions the only way to maintain the tradition sometimes is to break our tradition. It's the verse in Tehilim. There's a time to act for God. They nullified the, the Torah. So the, you have no choice. Either we could keep the Torah oral and then we'd be lost. We wouldn't have any Jews. Any, that, that Everybody would have assimilated. That would have been the end of Jewish history. So you know what? It's better to violate some parts of the Torah. Pikuach nefesh, if you want to call it, to violate some parts of the Torah. So it's probably the same thing uh, today. Even if the Rambam may have been right at some point in history, that it would be prohibited to take money, even if we followed that view. That's uh, very questionable, uh, or, uh, you know, we did, but um, it, it wouldn't be true anymore, because and uh, Ramosha Moshe Feinstein, I mentioned, has a, a tshuva. I don't want to get into this whole thing, but it, it's forbidden. It's forbidden not to get paid to teach Torah, it says, because uh, people like money. And if a person says he wants to volunteer, what do you mean he wants to volunteer? No, then he won't go and, and teach Torah. So it's forbidden to volunteer to teach Torah. I don't think that Ramosh is talking about a lawyer who makes a half a million dollars a year and gives a shear once a week. I think he's talking about teaching. In other words, you have to pay teachers a decent salary because otherwise they won't go into teaching, which is a big problem we have. We all know that, that uh, a teacher, even though they're way better paid than they used to be, they can't make enough money to send their kids to, to, to day school if they have four or five kids or even three kids, two kids, um, you know, at $25,000 a year. What does a teacher make? $100,000 a year. It's a very good salary for normal people, but in the Jewish community, Community doesn't work. So that's what the Ramosha says. You can't uh, volunteer. You got to pay well. Anyways, oh, the entire Jewish nation is commanded to sanctify the name. And as that points out, your question, which I really haven't thought about, is it says, so we know that Kiddush Hashem 
is really uh, very much, as the Rambam says, with non-Jews. We're commanded not to empty, to desecrate. We use desecrate. A halal means a vacuum. A halil is a flute, because a flute has nothing in it, just air. You just have to know how to move the fingers in the right places, the right holes. That's why a halil is a, a flute. We empty God's name. It's the same verse. Uh, what does that mean? So right away, the Rambam begins on non-Jews. When a non-Jew comes and he tells a Jew, um, puts a gun to his head and says, you break the Torah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. I'm going to kill you. So the Torah says, no. The Torah is meant for life. The Torah, you have to live in the Torah. So it's the same thing we were just saying on, 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 in another angle. Yeah, you have to break the Torah in order to, to keep the Torah. And what, what's, the, what's the point of dying? The point of the Torah is to keep us alive. So we shouldn't die with him. Be mate. This actually um, sounds very simple, but it's actually a major controversy in the Middle Ages. The Rambam says that if a person dies, he's not going to eat non-kosher food. A non-Jew puts a gun to his head and says, I'm going to kill you if you don't eat non-kosher food. And the guy said, I, can't, I just can't eat non-kosher food. So the Rambam says you're guilty of suicide. It's a terrible thing. He's guilty for giving up his life. So uh, we may have discussed one time in the past, this actually was a debate in the Middle Ages. The Tosfot, we're heirs more to the Tosfot than we are to the Rambam. In other words, the Ashkenazic tradition, even much of the Spartic tradition too, might say, might say that, you know, is uh, we, we don't, the Mishnah Torah is not our go-to book for Jewish law. It's a very important book, but uh, it's, it's more, you know, the briskers turned into commentary on the Talmud. They, they, they took away its codification powers and used it as trying to analyze what does the Rambam mean, but not as a, of course, uh, you can line the Rambam in many ways, but, but the, the, it's a Shulchan Aruch. It's not the Rambam that is our, our uh, sort of, you know, our go-to. We are, we're much more the tradition of Russian and Tosvat, the Ashkenazic um, tradition. The Balei HaTosvat were of the opinion that you're allowed to violate. You're allowed to eat non-kosher to save your food. In other words, the mitzvah of, of Kiddush Hashem is to sanctify God's name. And uh, okay, but I don't have to do that if, um, um, if uh, a non-Jew wants to kill me I, I don't have to do that. I, I, I can give up my life. Uh, my religion isn't as important. So the question, is that itself a sanctification of God's name? That's an interesting, interesting question. But uh, you don't have to give up your life. You're, you're, um, the Rambam says it's forbidden. What kind of a religion is that? That would be a Chilol Hashem. To give up your life, not to eat kosher, that's a desecration of God's name. What kind of God wants somebody to die because they can't eat kosher food? You can say it, God wants you to die if you deny God. Commit adultery, murder. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. So the three cardinal sins that we understand, everybody understands. Like, what do you mean? Well, what's the purpose of living if you have to kill somebody else to live? Uh, you know, innocent, an innocent person. What's the person of living even if you commit adultery? That's already, ooh, but okay, I can hear that. And what's the purpose of living if you deny God? So the three cardinal sins, but uh, what kind of God will say, give up your life because of Shabbos, because of Yom Kippur? So you're, you're not allowed to. Not to. The Tosfat says, no. The Balei Tosfat says, no, 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 no. You don't have to give up your life. But if you want to, uh, you're, you're a tzaddik. Wow. Uh, I, I love God so much. What's the purpose of living if I can't keep kosher? What's the person of being alive if I can't keep Shabbat? It's a fundamental argument. This is like an unbelievable argument. I think about it. Uh, I mentioned Chaim Soloveitchik, uh, the rough son, you know, the historian. So he, uh, he, his, he claimed, it's, he, it's part, he, he's a historian, okay? So he's doing it from, it's, it's very fascinating. You know, Chaim Salavechi was a, is a Gon Olam. He's like a, like a Salavechi. They're all brilliant. And he, for a while, when his father got sick, he gave his Gmarashir. Chaim Salavechi came to why he gave him Gmarashir. And like his father was in the early days, you know, if you didn't know half of Shas, he threw you out. You know, it asked question. It's a tos, what do you mean you don't know a Tosfot and Baba Kama? Get out of here. You know, he, he was very uh, harsh. And uh, he, his expectations were super high. He knows just backwards and forth. But uh, unlike his father, uh, he was he, he used the historical approach. To, I mean, that's he's more known as a historian than a, a Talmudist. Um, but um, he um, so he does historical analysis of sorts. That's something that in in many places is to say it's frowned upon is really an understatement. In many places that's viewed almost as heresy because Torah is sort of above time, but leave that argument for some other time. So um, Chaim Salavechik in his, uh, they have in his collected writing, so he's the, he's the expert in medieval Ashkenaz. He knows everything about medieval Ashkenaz. 
And he said, basically, a lot of this was a response to the, the Crusades. What happened is, I'm sure many of you know, Jews committed suicide. Jews, Jew, not committed suicide is not the right term to use, really. Jews, they killed themselves in order not to be baptized. They, they, the, the Christians were coming in in the Crusades, and they knew they couldn't withstand their, they were, they were afraid. So they decided it's better to kill their children and kill their wife and kill themselves. I mean, it's horrendous. You read some of the memoirs. It's like on Tisha B'Av, it's, 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 it's beyond scary. And then you read the most tragic of tragics when uh, somebody killed, uh, he killed his family. And then it turns out the crusaders didn't come. So he killed them for now. I mean, it's just horrendous. So the Bale Hatosva basically justified that behavior. It's very uh, not so simple to justify that. But uh, and Chaim Soloveitchik sort of develops the theme that they they had no choice. In other words, um, that we know this from a lot of Tosvats. We know that Tosva was very into justifying the practice of the people. In other words, when the people did something that appeared different from the Gemara, so Tosva, well, yeah, but okay, it doesn't apply. Like the, probably the famous example, how do we? do business with non-Jews on, on Christmas or, the, or th three days before Sunday. Uh, you know, so Tosva comes up, uh, this explanation, that explanation. Tosva was very much in trying to justify the practice of the people that we discussed, Chaim Salvech's Cardinal, mimetic tradition. We justify what was passed on, not so much text-based. Because he would say, I, he doesn't, I don't think he uses this term in this article, but uh, basically uh, on a text-based analysis, uh, you can't, uh, can't kill your, you have to let the non-Jews kill you. You can't kill you can't do them their favors and kill yourself because uh, they may kill you if you don't violate. But but he said these were pious people, super pious people, and they couldn't tolerate. How, how could you say that these people were guilty of terrible sins? So Tosva, okay, so whether you accept that or not, so whether there were historical reasons um, influencing how they interpreted the, the text, the bottom line is the Balei HaTosva do say that one is allowed. It's meritorious. It's meritorious. A non-Jew puts a gun to your head. And it says, eat non-kosher, it's meritorious if you give up your life. We don't follow that at all. We, we don't follow it. That view has not been accepted. You know, the, we accept the view of the Rambam. I don't think anybody today would be allowed to follow the view of the Tosva, but it's a fascinating, very important argument about what's the purpose of life and what's the purpose of mitzvah. Anyway, so that's the extreme of Kiddush Hashem. Uh, let's go back just very briefly to the Rambam for a moment. Uh, let me share my screen. And that the whole fifth chapter is about Kiddush. And the Rambam gives, of course, exceptions to the rule. We, uh, the Rambam says there are times you have to give up your life for um, um, for not kosher food. In terms of the Nazis, if it's a time of shmad, if it's a time of you know that you know people throw around the term shmad. You know the the Israeli government wants to do this. It's like they're they who knows what the, I don't want to uh, whatever. So people say uh, in in a time where there's religious persecution, so then you have to stand up for everything. So that becomes. Um, that's what the Ram writes, always the three cardinal sins. Now, what's very important, and the Ramam goes on to discuss, uh, they're, they're in Kalach Gimel, this is Beshat Gzeira, this is in a normal time. But if it's time of religious persecution, let's say of the Nazis, you have to do it. And the Ramam says again, if you do it, um, um, okay. um, that's good. And then the Ramam talks about about 10. Um, this Aishia of Kiddush Mobarabim, which is the end of the bracha, Mekadesh Mobarabim. There's a separate mitzvah that if you're in front of 10 Jews, and by the way, we know there's a minion from Betoch, the word Betoch, um, by the Hibatlu Mitoch Ha'eda Hazot. How do you know you, uh, we're in, in the sitter? How do you know you have a communal service only with 10 men? Okay, whatever. Uh, you need a minion of 10 men. How do, how do you know the number 10? It says Hibatlu Mitoch. B'nai Yisrael, um, that's by the, um, the Maraglim. Remove yourself from Betoch, and there were, of course, two good guys and ten not-so-good guys. And then it says, B'nik Dashti, Betoch, B'nai Yisrael. So the Gzei Rashava, well, that's one of the, third, the second principles of Rabbi Shmuel's 13 principles, word analysis. Uh, this today makes a lot of sense. In, in modern world, literary analysis is, is very in. So, but maybe a hundred years ago, it sounded a little bit strange because there's a word here, there's a word there, so what? But today, that's very, uh, very popular literary analysis. So the, the words are betoch, betoch. So you learn for everything of Kedusha, the Barku, Laning, anything of Kedusha, you need 10. This is where it's derived from. It's always fascinating. I, I don't know when last time I, if I ever pointed it out, the idea that we derive a minion from the Meraglim is a beautiful idea. Beautiful. In other words, how do you know you have to dive in with the community? Because of 10 sinners. 
In other words, um, in other words we don't learn it from Avram. The, the, we don't learn from righteous people. Ten sinners make a minion. Nine Moshe Rabbeinus don't make a minion. It's beautiful. Uh, and and you know the Gemara says that uh, uh, what do we do on Yom Kippur? Everybody knows we begin by inviting the sinners. And so Elaine mentioned before we have a lot of assimilation. Well, maybe if we invited the sinners, quote unquote, I don't like to use that term by that, but but you know what I mean. If we invited non-observant people to our home, I mean now it's hard in, in COVID. We invite them to shul and make them welcome. Maybe they'd be less assimilated. Um, but anyway, so uh, us, that's um, that to have a kiddush um, and their halachas. We're not going to get into it. That sometimes even. Um, in public, you do have to give up your life, um, even not for one of the big three um, sins. And then uh, here, and okay, the Rambam goes through all the uh, the details, um, except, but that th this is how the Rambam begins, really, his mission tour. The halakhic aspect of the mission tour begins with the mitzvah of Kiddush Shem. At one point, though, what happens if somebody doesn't give up their life? A non-Jew pu puts a gun to your head and says, convert to Christianity. You're in Christian Spain. It's 1492 or 1391, which is really when the persecutions began. And uh, I mentioned last week, I, I talked last week on Roger Maris, his mother not wanting to you know that he shouldn't know he's really, really Jewish. But uh, we know that in, uh, we don't, in 1390, well, we know probably uh, the vast majority of Spanish people converted to Christianity, maybe not, not willingly, and maybe, uh, of course, not willingly. Um, and, you know, may, and, uh, you know, whatever, and including many, many, many rabbis. I, I don't know the numbers, you have to ask the historians, but I, I would not be shocked if more than 50% of rabbis in Spain, um, that's a, again, you have to analyze, well, why, why in Ashkenaz did Jews give up their life and in Sfar they didn't? In other words, the, the kid is the willingness to die was much more, I forget somebody this week, and uh, who mentioned it in one of our shiurim, you look at the slichas, everyone is about the akeda. Of course, uh, yeah, on, on Wednesday night, Dr. Sokolo, the whole thing, how not to teach the akeda. So um, every one of the slichas, every day's akeda, akeda Yitzchak becomes a theme. And he said, because it's the the crusades. In other words, the, 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 the slichot are responding to the crusades and they're portraying, they're giving up their life like a real Akedah Yitzchak. Avram didn't have to sacrifice his son, but they do have to sacrifice their children. Awful, awful, awful. But why in Ashkenaz were Jews much more willing to die al Kedah Hashem than in Spain? So that's uh, not for our, that's, uh, it's hard to say that's related to a talk on the sitter. But uh, here we are talking about Mekadeh so uh, many, many Jews that did not uh, were not willing to uh, to do what they're ideally supposed to. So what what happens to them? Well, what do we consider? So it's very important. They're not considered idol worshippers. They did not do a vodazara. Uh, if somebody puts a gun to your head and says, a, a, a "Drink from the wine libations of." Of John, I have never been to to a church, but uh, whatever they do in their church services, uh, the wafers, I, I don't. Know, so, and and you participate in an in an idol worship service, and uh, and okay, you you don't really want to, but they force you, and uh, we don't consider you an idol worshiper. We consider you somebody who didn't sanctify the name of God. We're considered not mikdashmo. It's not a violation. That's the Rambam says that it's not a violation of a, even adultery. It's not a violation of murder. We, we wouldn't try a, a person who, God forbid, that he killed an innocent person to save his life. Uh, we know people do things like that. They, they snitched on somebody not, whatever, to save their life. We, I, we can't judge these people. But the halacha judges them not as murderers. We're, 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 no, we would never take them to court and try them for murder because they, they actually, even if they pulled the gun, actually they murdered the person. We don't consider that murder. Under duress is, is what, what do you want from the person? They're not supposed to do it. it it's wrong. But it's not considered murder when doing the risk. Of course, the flip side is also true. When a Jew observes mitzvot because of the rest, it doesn't really mean much. We need free choice, right? That's part of that's one of the reasons a balchuba is greater than someone not a balchuba. You know, if you're brought up your whole life, well, whatever, I'm going to eat non kosher food. Uh, it's like weird. I mean, I, I, I just my whole life, I, I never in my life, you know, so natural. So it's true. I have free choice, not the kosher, but I don't know that I have real free choice. I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, what are the? Ch I, I have this argument with my kids at chat all the time. You know, of, of course, if if I if I what happens if I would have grown up in a house that's not observant? What are the chances I would be observant? They're pretty small. I, I think why two two percent of people become less than two percent. Uh, whatever the numbers are from the conservative movement, it's about two three percent. Uh, from the reform, it's around one percent. And people who are unaffiliated. It's less. Uh, we know uh, the Balshuva movement 
is shrinking. Anybody who, who studies, anybody who reads the articles and is engaged in the Belgian world, it's not really my area, but I, I read, you know, I, I know it's going on a little bit. And the, the reason the Baltruba movement is actually shrinking today, it's much less than it was, is because the conservative movement is, is dying. And the pool of Baltruba, which is in of itself very important at our attitude. Uh, I'll say one thing, if I may, because I was listening to something last night in, in, on tape, and it really bothered me. But it wasn't a tour motion program. It, it, it really bothered me what the person was saying, saying how conservative and reformed Jews, you know, caused more, more, more Jews to lose to Judaism than Hitler did. And that really bothered me that somebody could say such a thing. In other words, he, because, you know, the millions of Jews have assimilated, which isn't conservative and reformed Jew. I can tell you this person would tell you that the secular Zionism has saved hundreds, millions of Jews because they maintained their Judaism because of secular Zionism. So that's exactly what I'll say with the conservative and reform movement. Baruch Hashem, the, uh, God, God saw it as, uh, as, as Moshe Terrigan, the, that's not him. The, Mo, Mo, the Rev. Ray Gush said, I remember years ago, he spoke here in Toronto. I, I, so he said that God in his infinite wisdom saw that the way to maintain the connection to Judaism for millions of Jews would be through secular Zionism. For whatever reason, religion didn't appeal to the, the masses of people. People were leaving religion in droves. But secular Zionism managed to, to save them that they're at least Jews. Yeah, they may not be religious. They, they may even eat on Yom Kippur. But you know, today, half the Jews in Israel keep kosher. So secular Zionism saved people for, for Yiddishkeit. I, I believe the same thing with the conservative and the reform movement. Yes, people assimilate, okay? People assimilate, but uh, it would be a lot worse. The conservative and reform movement should be seen as our partners, not as our uh, enemies, God forbid. And uh, they're preserving. And, and, and anybody who knows what's going on, they'll tell you the Baal the, the people who work in Baal Shuva movements, most of them, not the, will tell you they're very happy if a Jew goes to a reform shul. Baruch Hashem, he's, he's doing something. He goes to reform shul on, on Yom Kippur. So um, the concern, and the reason the Baal Shuvah movement, as I said, is shrinking is because the conservative movement, unfortunately, is dying. Uh, it's very sad. And because it's dying, we lost the pool. What are the chances of some guy who didn't know Alephate or the person who went to Hebrew school and conservative shul at a bar mitzvah, maybe, maybe even went to a, a high school, but you know, uh, Anyway, so that's just an aside, but um, sorry for that. But um, okay, um, but um, Kiddush Hashem, let's get back here. So um, um, I forget why. Oh, yeah. So we don't consider that person. Uh, um, I, well, I don't even know how I got onto this. Please, please remind me somebody. What was the connection? I'm sorry. Um, but let's get back here to Kiddush Hashem in public and um and uh, when you have, oh yeah, I was saying right. If you don't, if you don't buy like Kiddush Hashem, okay, how how many Jews will? How many Jews um, rabbis in Spain uh, converted? Not under us because not under pressure, right? So I said when a person does a mitzvah under pressure, that's how we got into it. So when you, I keep kosher because my parents kept kosher. I would never think of it. So yeah, it's nice, it's beautiful, but I don't know how it's meaningful, much more meaningful when you choose it. It's a fine line. I don't know how to balance that. I don't know. Obviously, we want to bring up our kids to be observant. And the way to do that is to be observant. And to Shabbos, of course, we do that. But on, on the other hand, there's a little bit of a, like, where, where does a kid bring their own, um, you know, where's their Naseb Benishma? Where's their acceptance? Or I, I don't know. I don't know how to deal with the issue. If anybody has any ideas, I just think it's an important thing to, to think about. It. And we know the Halakha says the Balchuba is on a higher level. One, because they really chose. They weren't brought up that way. That's much greater. Okay, you're brought up that way. What, what do you want? Obviously, most people follow in the path of their parents. Uh, it works both ways. Some people, quote, quote, unquote, I even though the term, I don't know that I like the term, off the derrick, whatever term you want to use. But you have the on the derrick people. So, but most people, uh, you know, follow them pretty much they're what their parents do. That's that's normal. That's how normal people are. Okay, that, but let, let's move on a little bit. So let me ask you the bracha ends okay so we say um god your kadesh shimcha we have to sanctify god's name we've spoken many times that the role of the jewish person is to call out on god's name Avram to, to sanctify god's name god's name is the essence the torah is a description of god's name that's what the torah is torah is god's autobiography so our our mitzvah that that's why the rambam begins kiddush hashem sanctify god's name that's how the rambam begins the whole the, the mission torah so then we say like this I want somebody to translate this. You know, I, I've said this bracha, I don't know, uh, how many thousands of times. Baruch, well, it's interesting. In my, I don't know, you can tell me in your sitter. Does it say Atah Hashem? Um, it says here, Baruch Atah Hashem HaMekadesh Et Shemo Birabim. By the way, I think many don't have Ha. 
Mekadesh. It's interesting. You have to let me. Does your sitter have the hay or not? Berachata Mekadesh Movarim Hamikadesh. I want somebody to translate that. What does that bracha mean? Berachata. Some have it with God's name. We'll talk about that in a minute. Some without God's name. And some sidurim. Or Salavechik said it without God's name. But Berachata Mekadesh Et Shemo Berabim. Somebody translate that, please. Everybody's afraid. I, I, don't worry. Whatever you say will be right. Anybody? Okay. Tova, can I pick on you? Or is that a violation of honoring your older sister? No. Mikadesh et Shemob Rabim. You sanctify yeah. his name in the moment. Baruch Hashem. Blessed is God. Yeah. What it's, are we blessing God for? Uh, who sanctifies? That's the question. Are we sanctifying or is yeah. God sanctifying? There's a problem in the bracha. God opens our eyes. God uh, lets us walk. God lets us see. God gives us knowledge. God heals. Uh, you know, right? What does it mean? God who sanctifies God's name in public. That's what it says. Blessed are you, God. First of all, Baruch HaTashem, we're addressing God. HaMikadesh Et Shemo is in the third person. We're not addressing God. It should say, um, I, 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 yeah. I you have Baruch HaMikadesh Mo Barabim. Correct, Baruch HaMikadesh. I said many Sidurim don't have a Tashem because this bracha, remember we've said this was added for historical reasons when Jews are not allowed to say Shema. So this has no source in the Talmud. This is no, uh, this is an add-on. So the question is, can you add on an extra bracha? This question comes up all the time. We discussed it already. Hanotein le koach. Hanotein le koach does not appear in the Gemara. So we showed you it's a verse in Yeshayahu. It's about the return of the Jewish people. The Jewish people are tired. It's a national verse. But but um, this but some people didn't say that bracha. I mean, we all say it. It's in the Siddur. But, uh, you know, people are very learned into the stuff. Well, you know, the briskers, let's say. So uh, they didn't say the bracha. So Rav Soloveitchik didn't say this. Is on the time with, he said, Baruch HaMekadesh, without God's name. And for whatever reason, I think I know the reason, even though I don't follow lesser of Rav Soloveitchik's, you know, individual in those idiosyncrasies, you know, the briskers had all these strange ways of doing things. And the Rav would tell people not to follow him. Like, hey, follow your practice. But the, the briskers had their own, crazy, they had five sparring, for example. They had all kinds of strange practices. That's uh, that's their style. Beseder. But uh, the Rav wouldn't did so. But this one I follow. But I, I, I Baruch Hashem, usually for whatever reason that I, um, I don't say God's name, but because it's it's not appears in the Gemara, so the Rev said you shouldn't say it. But even Baruch, so Baruch HaMekadeh Rim, actually, based on my question, I don't think it makes much more sense. Blessed is the one who sanctifies God's name in public. If you take out God's name, then it's, I don't know if anybody, anybody says this, this is my own interpretation, that Baruch, blessed, are those who sanctify God's name in public. But once you say Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed is God who sanctifies the name in public. Well, it's very strange. What, what does that mean? What does it mean? Yes. So I think we'll get there. I think I have the answer, to the, maybe. But uh, I, I just want to point out, it's a very strange bracha. We're, 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 we're blessing God for sanctifying God's name. We have to sanctify God's name, not God has to sanctify, right? God heals. So we go to doctors, but ultimately God is the healer, right? Everything, that's every bracha. We, man does their part, but ultimately your success is up to God. The farmer works really hard, but if God doesn't bring rain, then atati matar tzachem bito, uh, you're finished. So the bracha is thanking God mm -hmm. for partnering with us, for taking our efforts and make them, we go to the doctor, but bracha, some people heal and some people don't heal. So we thank God as the ultimate healer. But here, what, what's the mitzvah on God? Well, what's God's role? Kiddush Hashem is totally dependent on us. How It's our relationship to God. It's not, we thank, what do you mean? We thank God for sanctifying his name. So maybe we have answers to that, but I, I throw that out if anybody wants to say anything about well, that. Well, we see this, Rabbi Kalman. Yeah. It's, even, even if we left out the Atah Hashem at the end, if you look, um, further up, we say it beforehand. The Kadesh es Shimcha ba'olamecha. So already, we're already telling God that you sanctify right. your Kadesh, name. Correct, correct. So I, I think the answer, which we'll get to in in a few minutes, is it's and in a certain sense that is the point that God, I, I God sanctifies His name by the way He acts in history. Okay, that we're going to develop that 
in in a, in 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 a couple of minutes. In other words, is God it, is the one who sacrifices his name. We in other words, we have to normally God has to partner with us in order to heal us, to give us intelligence, all the things we we ask God for. So we got to do our part and then we ask God to partner with us. Here in Kiddush Hashem, I think it's the exact opposite. God God does his part and then he asks man to partner with him. Kind of like how God created the world, right? God created the world. Prove is it, or, hmm? I'm is sorry? it possible? Is it possible that at least we uh, we have come to the point where we what we acknowledge that we need to sanctify God's name, or not necessarily need, but we do sanctify God's name. Right. We we have to say right. We always understand that the mitzvah of Kiddush is upon us, but the way the bracha sounds, it's like on, on God. In other words, we're thanking God for God to sanctify the name. We don't say. Um, we should sanctify God's name. We say, God, God, we bless you for sanctifying your name. Mm-hmm. What does that do with anything? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I bless God because he heals us. That's great. What do I mean? I bless God for sanctifying his name. That's like our job to sanctify his name. It's like a weird thing. I, I don't know. Maybe you don't understand. Maybe you think the question makes no sense. I, I just find it a little bit strange, a strange formulation of the bracha. And I think maybe it'd be like maybe the answer is better than the question you know that's uh, the Magid of Duvna you know the old joke right the the Magid of Duvna I think I don't know if it was the Vilna God he lived at the same time as the Vilna God he uh, you know he had a parable for everything so they asked him once and where, where do you get a how, how do you have a parable for everything everybody says something you always have a, a story for everything every pastor you have a, a story for how do you do that so it's, it's easy he says you know if you're doing bow and arrow so you know it's it's very hard to hit the the target in the middle but if you shoot the arrow and then you draw the, the target afterwards, it's very easy. So it says, I developed a story first, and then I look for a verse to put into the story. So I always have a, you know, you, you make up the parable first, and then you can do whatever you want. So I don't know, may, maybe, so sometimes the answer is better, sometimes the question is better than the answer, but sometimes you, you have the answer, you have the answer, you need, you, need, you need a question. I don't know. So I guess, so. Let, let me go here then, let me show you. Okay, let, before we do that, I'm, I, I'm going to... Okay, I, um, the next paragraph. So I want to say something. Maybe if you don't like it, tell it we'll take it off on the tape. Okay, we, we can censor it. But um, I have never said this paragraph in my life. I don't know. I, ne- I, I, I have never in my life had said this paragraph. And the first time in my life I ever looked at it was last week in preparing for the shear. I, I looked at this paragraph for the first time in my life. I, and maybe I'm crazy. Does anybody, does everybody say this every day? That sounds a little familiar, right? God gather your... Um, People from the four corners of the earth, Yakiru Beyedu Koba Eolam. Here's that expression, right? Koba Eolam, all who come to the world. That means non Jews. Okay, this, do people say this every day? Can somebody let me know? Or am I in good company? Or nobody wants to uh, admit that? That's okay. <laughs> I used to say it. You used to say it. Very good. That's, uh, I don't know. I, I've never, every shul that I know. So some shuls say korbanas, okay. You know, those that do, but growing up in the schools, at least uh, Camp Mosheva, maybe I don't want to blame Camp Mosheva, but, and when I went to school and, and in chat minion, they go straight from Mikadesh Shemol Barabim to Rabbi Shemol Omer. I think many shuls do that. Um, we'll get to why that's not such a good idea either today or next week, the importance of, of, of Korbanot. This is the boring part in the middle that we're going to get to soon, hopefully. But, um, you know, many people skip that. So I, I they always skip from Mekadesh That's how I was brought up. You do what you're brought up with. That's what I told you. It's hard to change. So I don't know. I, I, it's in the city. That's the part of the city you skip, right? I told you the, the joke already. The, the Gera Rebbe said, this year, everybody's wondering in COVID, what can you skip? So you skip this, you skip that. So why don't they print a, a sitter with all the stuff taken out? just to make it shorter. What do you need a big muxer for? It wouldn't be the same thing. People like to skip the dummy. In other words, they get the pleasure out of missing 20, ah, the short dummy. If they just printed what you say, no, 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 that, what, that, that's not how, right? You know, like on the keynote on Tishavav, you know, now today everybody does selected keynote for Hashem because they explain them. So, you know, you do, and then they, the rabbi announces, okay, go from page 22 to page 48. Wow, so people are so excited, you know? So this is like part of the sitter that I never in my life, it was a part of the sitter I skipped. Who, 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 who ever heard of saying it? 
But like everything, it's in the sitter for a good reason. Maybe at Chatai, maybe I'll, I'll do tshuva. Haven't done it yet. I, even though I started learning last week, I still haven't said it yet. Maybe on Shabbos, maybe, please God. Okay, um, so what is this paragraph all about? Everybody having the sitter right after Mekadesh Shemavavim. to your God in the heavens, in the El Yonim, up in the high heavens, you're first, you're last, nobody else like you. And then all of a sudden we say to God, God, return us to the land of Israel. May those who show hope in you, right? May Arba cut for Aretz from the four corners, and everybody in the world should know God. It's a funny thing. God return us to Israel. Why should we go back to Israel? So the whole world should recognize God. It's a funny one. Well, wow, that's amazing. Why why is Zionism created? Why why do we have a why do we have a state of Israel? <coughs> what does it say here? Remember, I told you, Be'olam means all the people in the world. The reason we want Jews people to go to Israel is to sanctify God's name for the non-Jews in order that the whole world should know. I thought I went to Israel because I can do more mitzvot, right? That's the famous Gemara in Soto. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu go on and go to Israel? Did he want to eat Jaffa oranges? That's really what the Gemara says. They didn't put in Jaffa, but they put in oranges. Did Moshe Rabbeinu want to eat the oranges, or the, the fruit of Israel? Like, yeah, okay, it's good fruit, it's nice, Israel is nice fruit. That, uh, that uh, Moshe could do without that. He was on, on, on 40 days, Mount Sinai, he didn't eat anything. He doesn't eat the fruit of Israel. It's to do mitzvahs. Uh, there's so many mitzvahs that only apply in Israel that I, can, I cannot do. That's why Moshe, the Torah Moshe. But that's not what it says here. It says we go to Israel in order that so the entire world should know there's one God in the world. What's the mission of the Jewish people? To spread the name of God to the entire world. In order to do that, we need to have a, a state of Israel. That's the way to do it. Mitzvahs, that's secondary. That's important. Important, sure. But Kiddush Hashem is the most important. right? We discussed that's the one mitzvah. Hashem, you can't do... do do, do tshuva first. So it's just a, it's an amazing verse. Like I, 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 I'm thank God now. Thank God I give this class. I would never know it exists. I mean, this idea. It's not the only place this idea exists, but it's so in your face here. Like mamash, God, we pray to you to bring us back from the four corners of the world in order that everybody in the world should come to recognize God. So let's just do a famous. I don't know, famous. I, you know, I, I, I told you one of my. Uh, I give you know give shurim in the where where I dub in and you know so I would often say I try not to say it anymore because of. That's what he told me. He says, you know, it's well known. And he'll come, you know, it's not so well known. I don't know it, you know, like I don't know it. So it's like he felt bad. It was like almost insulting that I would say it's very well known. And if you don't know it, so I'm going to quote a verse that is not so well known. And if you know it, that's great. Then you're like a great Torah scholar. But uh, it's not, I, I really don't know how well known it is. Um, let's go. Let me find it. Yecheskel, uh, the prophet Yecheskel, are three great Nevi'im Achronim. Okay. So let's start. So Yechezkel says, yeah, I, that's another, who learns Nevi'im Machronim? Okay, but he's Hashem Eli Lemor. And God spoke him, Ben Adam, Yoshvim Alat Matam. You're sitting on your soya v'yitamu otam. So when the Jewish people sin in the land of Israel, Ketumat Hanida, that's a, Today, maybe people don't like that, but that's a very common thing that in our prayers, we have in the Sikha, it's like the, the tumah of the Nida, that uh, her, the impurity, it's, uh, it's uh, bad. God says, I'll get mad at you. Um, okay, so I'm go you're going to go to exile. I'm going to throw you out of the land of Israel because uh, you don't keep the mitzvot. You, you, you sullied the land. You impurified it. Uh, so you'll come to the, the you'll, you'll live in America, wherever you live. You'll desecrate my name. Now, so you can say two things. You could say, you'll go to exile, and when you're in exile, you're going to give up mitzvahs, and you're going to assimilate, so you'll desecrate my name. Or you can say, as probably is the meaning here, being in exile is a desecration of God's name. In other words, it's not that you will go to exile and desecrate my name. You will go to ex by going to exile, you're desecrating God's name. I'm curious how they did it in English. When they came to the nations, they caused my holy name to be profaned. It's a little bit unclear what, which one they're going. But by the merit. So yet so yeah, I mean the Pasuk is pretty clear. These are the people of the Lord, they had to leave his land. That's the Chilul Hashem as we got thrown out. So God will eventually al Shem Kutshi. It's all about God's name, right? It's all about God will have mercy on his own name. Now we're hearing Mikadesh et Shimcha Barabim. Now we're hearing God sanctifies his own name. 
God has mercy on his own name. God has to sanctify it. We're not doing it for him. So God, need, God sanctifies his name. Asher chilulu, Beit Yisrael. The Jewish people sully the name of God. God has mercy, and he has to sanctify his name. Bagoyim, with the non with the Jews is one problem, but we're more concerned what the non-Jews are going to think. Lachain. So God tells Yechezkel, go tell the Jewish people. And more Lebet Yilkoamar Hashem Elokim Lo Lemanchem Lo. Um, not for your sake. I don't. You guys, you you sinners. And Yosef Beit Yilkim L'Shem Kodeshi. And what I'm going to do now is because God says I have to sanctify my own name. It's like an unbelievable thing. There's so much to think about. We can't do everything. You Jewish people, you desecrated my name among the nations of the world. The Kidashti, but I'm going to sanctify at Shmi, not not at uh, You're. I'm going to sanctify my great name, Hamichulabagoyim, that has been desecrated in the non-Jews that you guys did it. The fact that you're living with the non-Jews, yours, that's a desecration of God's name. So the world, nations of the world should know that I'm the Lord. It's all about the nations of the world. Now you can know where this paragraph is, is coming from. So I will have to take you from the land. And I'll take you. The reason you're getting it, you're not such great sadikim. I have to do it because you so you so sullied my name. I'm going to bring you back. Then I'm going to return you to the land. This verse you all know. This one I can say you all know. We say it. How many times do we say it in the Seretimei Tshuva? I will throw upon you pure water and I will purify you from all your sins. And I will give you a new heart. Ah. Where we a new Jew, a new Jew in Israel, a new spirit. I'll remove that, that heart of stone that you developed in thousands of years of exile. And I'll give you a, a pure a heart of meat, a flesh, flexible. Now you're going to follow my ways, follow the, uh, the, the uh, rules of God, and then you can dwell in the land. You can be my people, and then I can be your God. I can't be your God in the Chutzarts. The Torah cannot not be implemented. 80%, whatever percent of the Torah cannot apply outside of Israel. Even the parts that do apply outside of Israel, it's not the same way. The Ramban that develops this all the time. There's a qualitative difference between a mezuzah in New York and Toronto than in Israel. It's not just the, the mezuzah has nothing to do with the land. No, it's not the same mezuzah. We don't have time for that now, but but anyway, so th this is uh, this is pretty clear. I mean, uh, and now this, of course, what that was the Rav's error. And then I'll just go to the last verse in this section. You see the the partial break. I'm not doing it for your sake. God, God tells the Jewish people, I'm doing it for my sake. But I want you to be ashamed of your terrible ways, and I want you to improve. So this is really, I, I, in, a, in a sense, it's pretty like uh, wild, you know. Uh, Coming to Israel has nothing to do with our merit. It's all about God's name. And this, of course, will explain very simply sort of what the Rub said. I, I, you know, we think about why the state of Israel after the Holocaust. There was no greater Chilol Hashem in history than the Holocaust. And there's no greater Kiddush Hashem in the last 2,000 years in the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. And that's probably what the Rav meant. I, 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 you know, I, I, I didn't hear it with my own ears. But, you know, I've mentioned before when Rav Soloveitchik was asked, why did our generation merit? Why did our generation marry to the land of Israel? And you know what the Rav's answer was? Anybody know what the Rav's answer was? Well, what about the Vilna Gon, the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Kiv Eger? Because we needed that? it. Because we needed it. We needed it. So I think the Rav, um, the Rav often there meant the Jewish people couldn't have survived. We would have all assimilated. How many people we discussed last week, how many people lost their faith? It would have been impossible for Jews. Who, who would blame Jews? Who would want to be Jewish? So we needed it. But also God needed it. God needed it to, in order to rescue his name. And the Rav talks about that in Kodo Dido Fake. Uh, how, how many people here have read Kodo Dido Fake? Can I not have a show of hands? But I'm just curious. You have read it. Have read it. I see one hand up. Okay. Really, have, have people not read it? I'm just curious. Two people. I'm sure more than two people have read it. But um, Kodo Dido Fake was the Rav's uh, famous Zionistic manifesto given on Yom Asmud in 1956 in Lamport Auditorium, I believe, before I was born. Um, but uh, the the Rav spoke on um, on uh, on and he called it Dido Fake as a pasuk in Shir 
Ashirim, the beloved, the beloved, God is knocking on the door. And the rabs, you know, uh, the dialectic, the good worth, the yearning, the lover, and when they come near, they separate. And, and so the rab called Odito fake, that God knocked on the door. And Zionism were six knocks. The rab famously describes the six knocks. Dam Yehudi ain't no hefker. Jewish blood is no longer free to, you know, we, we respond. And, uh, and one of the, 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 you know, difficult, one of the knocks um, is that, um, the name of God, we're, 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 we're rescuing God. And because uh, the, the Chilul Hashem, and the rabbi, I believe it's there that he mentioned when he used to travel on the train from Boston to New York in the 40s. Remember, the rabbi comes to America in 1931. And he comes to Boston and he comes to New York in 1941. Comes and that's for 44 years, travels every week from Boston to New York. Um, he didn't want to leave Boston. He was settled in the, the rub of the community in Maimonides High, in Maimonides, and uh, it's an amazing thing. And they went Tuesdays to Thursdays, whatever. He used to go, go Tuesdays to Wednesdays. And then his doctors, they used to give four or five hour shiurim, and then he had health issues. The rub had cancer. Uh, many people don't know this rub had cancer in the late 50s. And uh, thank God he, he, he recovered. Uh, maybe early 60s, they postponed the wedding. Tova and Aaron Lichtenstein were supposed to get married and the Rev got cancer. And I think, I don't know if he's in the hospital, but they postponed the wedding a few months uh, while the Rev was getting treated and Baruch Hashem, he was better. Unfortunately, his wife got cancer a few years later and wasn't. But um, anyway, so um, um, so um, the Rev, so he used to travel. So the doctors told him he can't work so hard. He can't give five hours shirim anymore. So the Rev said, okay. So he decided, okay, I'll give three hours shirim. But then he came for, for three days. Instead of giving four, four or five hours shirim, two days, he gave uh, 10 hours of shirim over three days. Okay, that's what he did. So he traveled to Boston. He said before 1948, he would go on the train, Christian missionaries, people would make fun of him, you Jews, yeah, God forsaken you. It was like, uh, he, it was a uh, well, Shem. What kind of God? How, how can you be Jewish in this world? God has forsaken you, become a Christian already. You know? So, and then after with the creation of the state of Israel, that, that stopped. The, the, it's not a coincidence there. Uh, I've said many, how many Bali Chuva were there from the year 70 to 1948? I don't think there were five. And I don't think I'm exaggerating. I don't think there were five people born not religious who became religious. Okay, so maybe it didn't count in the Middle Ages, everybody. Uh, but let's say from the modern period, from the 1700s, from before Mendelssohn till 1948, how many Jews came from non religious home to become religious? I, you can count them on one hand for sure. And how many Jews? left Judaism and became Christians, you can't count them. Hundreds of thousands in, in the 1800s, uh, early 1900s, right? Uh, I said, um, right, I, I said, um, right, one of our speakers a number of years ago, right, went through and said, how many people here know somebody who converted to Christianity? So not one hand went up. Do you know? Okay, impressive. I'm in, impressive, <laughs> sad. I don't know what the word is. Uh, how many of you know somebody who converted to Judaism? Every person here knows at least five people who converted. I don't believe anybody's on this Zoom call who doesn't know five people who converted to Judaism. You, it would have, a hundred years ago, not one person would have known somebody who converted to Judaism and everybody would have known somebody who converted to, to Christianity. That's the, the world word. It totally changed. 1948, God sanctified his name. Now people recognize there's a God in the world. The whole Baal Shuma, and at the, 1948 to 67, it was like, you know, you know pregnant. Who was pregnant. And in 1967, it was really born. And the, all the Bali Chuba, the whole Bali Chuba movement exploded in 67. And I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm guessing about 25% of the Orthodox world today, at least in America. I don't know, I'm talking the Hasidic world. I, I don't know enough about the world, but, but uh, you know, 25% of the modern Orthodox world, at least I would say, are, are Bali Chuba. Just think of all your shuls and think of, go through all the people in your shul. How many of them are Bali Chuba? I guarantee. I can almost guarantee you it will be a minimum of 20% of my rituals. And please let me know if I'm wrong. I really would like to know that. But I think just on your mind, just think of, I know, I don't know the last time people went to shul sometime, maybe it was over two years ago, but think of your shul and think of how many Bali Shuvah. So that's God returning us to the land of Israel in order to sanctify his name. That's Mekadesh at Shimcha, the Rabbi, Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed is God who sanctifies his own name in public. How does God sanctify his name? by bringing us back to the land of Israel. And that's what the next paragraph is. And this has nothing to do with your Zionist, not a Zionist, a good uh, Mitzrach. This is, this is a, what it says. I just don't just tell you what the word, unless I'm misinterpreting the words. Um, but that, that's what we pray for, that Chor Ba'e Olam. Um, Chor Ba'e Olam, and that's what we said. Um, so that's the greatest kid is Yashem we have. What I didn't get to discuss, because I'll discuss it for maybe one minute, maybe we'll pick up on this next week, 
is the more traditional explanations of, of Kiddush Hashem. I imagine, maybe you've heard this before, I, I don't know, but this is normally when we speak of Kiddush Hashem, this is not how we, we phrase it. We speak about Kiddush Hashem and the ethical behavior of the Jew, and that's also important, but that it's 9.56 already, so we'll, we'll wait till next week, please God, to pick up on that. But, um, but this is in terms of what our sitter says, may, uh, the, the Kiddush Hashem, and there's, it, it, it's, that's really, it's the second paragraph. We, we don't know. The first paragraph just says, God, you're before the world, you're above time, you created the world, sanctify your name, but it doesn't tell us how. It, 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 it tell us. This paragraph that I never said in my life, and maybe, please God, after this year, I better say it tomorrow for the first time in my life, um, uh, that uh, it talks about the way where Mekadosh Hashem is through the return. Re, 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 remember again, this whole thing was established when the Jews were in exile and they didn't allow them to say Shema. So historically, it makes a lot of sense why they're putting this in. But the, so I'm not, the, I'm not saying it's the only form of Kiddush Hashem, but that's the form of Kiddush Hashem we see every day in the Siddur. And I, maybe I'll just end, maybe I'll just show you one pasuk and um, a well-known pasuk. I didn't, uh, I didn't prepare it in that, but you give me half a second. Let me just share my screen. I will go here and then uh, just see if my computer is working fast enough. Okay, let's go. Where are we here? Too many things up on here. Let's go. Dvarim. I think it's Dvarim. Oh, that didn't work. All right, then, Dvarim 4, Deuteronomy 4. Uh, this is Parsha Veinach, uh, This is Mamash in the Chumash. It's like one of the most important verses in the Chumash. I'm sure people know, but I don't know if they pay too, a lot of attention. Attention, this is Moshe has been praying to enter the land of Israel. It's all about going to the land of Israel. He daven, daven, and God said, enough already. Stop hucking me a trinic. I've had enough of you. He got angry at him. You know, enough already. You're, you're, you're not going into the land of Israel. So um, um, then uh, here it says, so, so then, okay, Moshe starts his whole speech. You saw what God has done. Uh, don't follow the idolatrous ways. Um, those who cling to God, this pasuk is well known. That we know, of course. Um, and then, I teach you chukim umishpatim. I teach you laws and judgments. Rabbi Liptag has spoken about this a lot. Of Hashem. And here, this ushmartem basitem ki chachmatem v'binatem leinayanim. Why do you keep the Torah? You keep it because this is our wisdom and our. Uh, they say discernment, our wisdom and understanding. However, you understand chachma v'bina leinayamim. The Torah is a way to see the wisdom and the genius of the Jewish. The non-Jews are going to see, let's take a look at Israel. Look at these Jews. Why did they win so many Nobel Prizes? Why were they the first in the vaccine rollout? Well, what is this about the state? Why are they the world superpower in water? Why does every American high-tech company have a place in Israel? Why, why did they do most of the smartphone technology? How did they develop the Iron Dome? What, what, what is this country? So they're going to rock on Chacham ben Avon People are going to say, wow, wow, this nation, such an amazing nation. That's that's it. We come to Israel so we can nation. Now, how does the Gemara interpret this pasuk? You've got to see the Chachma, the Bina. That's why in living in Israel, you can't do that as a Jew. I mean, you do a little bit in Israel. How does the Gemara interpret that pasuk? Anybody know what the Gemara says on that pasuk? What the pasuk teaches us halakhically? The Gemara says they have to learn mathematics. Uh, I think they said astrology and math. Those were the sciences of the day. In other words, the Torah mandate is for the Jewish people to be so smart that the nations of the world are really impressed. That means we have to be smart. That means we've got to go to Harvard, whatever. I mean, that's what the rub sent all three kids to Harvard. And you got to, whatever. You, okay, you don't have to go. I didn't go to Harvard, so whatever. But uh, you have to, you know, you have to be chokma ubina. So the goyim will say, rakam chacham. Now, it's really a secondary point, and this will end. I say it's late, I'm sorry. Um, that it's not just will be the smartest, will be morality and and uh, intellect will go together. The greatest problem the Jews had is, in other words, will be shmartem ata chukim In other words, Moshe introduces, you got to keep the Torah, keep the Torah and be wisdom. Torah mata, you got to be amazing at both because that's the mission of the Jewish people. Why did we, why did we have to, why did we leave Egypt? We, why, why do we go to Egypt? Because God wanted us to see the most technologically advanced country in the world. It was very important for Jews not to develop in Ahitam. 
You, you grew up in a uh, hick town. You become, I don't mean to pick any, on anybody, but I don't, I don't mean it geographically. I mean it intellectually. You can grow up in a hick town and go on and go to Harvard, whatever, become a great person. But I'm saying you, you have to see greatness. So the Jewish people had to be in Egypt, had to see the most advanced country, and yet see how morally depraved, like like Nazi Germany. See how great the Germans were. They were the world leader in so many fields. But yet, often that greatness goes with horrendous morality. See what's going on in China today a little bit. They're tremendously advanced in many ways, but their moral alley is very sad. So that's the tourists coming to say, you got to go to Egypt. You got to see. You got to have Chachma Bina. But it's got to be Shmartem at Hachukim Bet Tamish Betimil. And that's the greatest Kiddush. And that's our mission in life. That's the Jewish mission. That's where we start. Okay. Um, well, let, let me just quickly review, and anybody, please, any criticism, please let me know, and uh, I always like to hear people who don't agree with what I say and question. Okay, so we discussed a little bit uh, the, the Rambam, we discussed a lot, the Rambam begins uh, this code of Jewish law, really the part that's the practical part on the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, and, uh, and uh, where you have to live, and then we saw the debate between the Rambam and Tos, whether you're allowed to give up whether you're allowed to violate the Torah to keep kosher, to keep shred, or you're, um, you're obligated. And we, of course, follow the opinion that that's, that would be a chilul Hashem, a chilul Hashem to give up your life, not to keep kosher. And Tosfot says, no, that would be a sanctification of God's name. Wow, you're so devoted to God that even for kashrut, you won't give up. Then we discussed the problem, really, about the bracha sort of as this weird language um, where God is sanctifying himself. So how does God sanctify himself? So that we went through the first... In, in, in Yecheskel, that our mission in life is to sanctify God's name, but it's, um, and, but um, God, our exile is a desecration of God's name by definition. Our exile is a desecration of the God's name, and, uh, and the return to Israel by definition is a sanctification of the God's name. Then we have to make more. We have to, so God is the one who got so upset. His name was so desecrated that the, the 2,500 years ago with Yecheskel and during the Holocaust, and God said, okay, enough. I better sanctify. I better rescue myself. I better rescue myself. And then he asked on the, on the Jewish people to help him. We're helping God to sanctify his own name. Okay, so that, that's basically in a nutshell. Just took me a long time to say that. And um, okay, and please God, next week we'll pick up on that and we'll then we'll get to the Korbanot section where that's basically we're at the kor Korbanot. But I'm, we're, I don't, we're not going to go through every line by line the Korbanot, I, I don't think, unless you all beg me to. Um, but I think we'll go through sort of why these why the key or the Korban Tamid, why these things were chosen, why we say Ezra Mekoman, and that gets rubbish. We'll spend a couple weeks. So that I, I used to say more religiously, and uh, some, I say the Korban Tamid every day, but okay, I don't have to tell you about the things I skip and I, I don't skip necessarily, but it is interesting. We're all products of our environment. And when I grew up, uh, you said, Mekadesh Shemovrim, you didn't say any Korbanas, no, where I went. And then they skipped the rubbish. That's what they did in camp. That's what, that's what they do now in my minion. Or we dove in pretty much, they don't say any Kurbanas. And uh, but I say when I got to YU and Rav Shachter Shir, he convinced me about the importance of Kurbanot. So I changed my practice a little bit. Okay, let me see if there. Thank you very much for uh, being here and uh, look to see you in, hopefully next week. I mentioned the three new courses we're starting next week Mickey Let Esther with Aaron Kohler on Tuesday morning, then Wednesday at 11 a.m. Menachem Kellner on the Rambam and Yehuda Halevi, the two very different medieval thinkers very different views. And then um, uh, Jewish communities around the world, beginning with M Morocco, Mark Shapiro, interviewing Rafi, um, who's the great, he's the one in Morocco, knows everything lives in Morocco. David, did you have your hand up? You want to ask a question? If anyone wants to ask a question live, that's fine. Uh, it's great. Unmute yourself. Let me go in, just see quickly any questions in the chat box. Uh, let me go up here. Boy, I see a bunch of comments. Okay, where are we? We're so assimilated. We ad ad address that, right? Assimilation is a desecration of God's name, but we have to help God. Like I say, in invite them over. But uh, you're right. So that's why I said conservative and reform are, I believe, are preventing assimilation, just like the secular Zionists are. It doesn't mean we agree with the, what they do. That, that's, that, that's not the same thing. I don't become a secular Zionist, but so many of the religious Zionists are, are willing to partner and see the greatness in secular Zionism, but somehow disdain reform and conservative Judaism. I don't get it. 
I don't know what the difference is. What happens to be living in Israel? What happens to be living mainly outside of Israel? But both of them were, were variations on traditional Judaism that they felt was the way Judaism is to be observed. I mean, the truth of the secular Zionists are much, quote unquote, worse, are much less religious. Reform and conservative, uh, go to shul, they God, secular Zionism uh, was totally not religious, but okay, we'll leave that for another time. A doctor gave up like King David, but yeah, big problem. Yeah, they, David sinned. We'll have to leave that for other discussion, but absolutely. Uh, that's the beauty of our, our Torah. It doesn't paint our heroes as great people. He did tshuva. He did tshuva. Yes, he did terrible sins. <laughs> Miriam sinned. Moshe sinned. God, well, why couldn't Moshe go to the land of Israel? I said that last verse. God, Moshe's going. He sinned. He did something wrong. We don't hide their sins. But yeah, and sometimes we do terrible sins. So I, I just sent out the Fiomi yesterday. I don't know if anybody read it. I, I, I don't understand. Maybe somebody has an, uh, but maybe not, you'll, you'll read it. But the uh, Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, he killed Yehuda Ben he, he he took a look at him and he killed him. I, well, <laughs> I, I mean, maybe the Gemara said literal, but the Gemara said he was so angry at him. Where he did, he said, you're still alive. And he gave him a glaze, Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, after the years of the cave. And he turned him into a heap of, of, uh, of, of bones. I don't know, somehow... That doesn't appear like, I don't know what baiting, you know, you can get upset. I, I don't know. I don't understand these things necessarily. But okay, that's maybe a little bit more metaphorical. But yes, where it's uh, adultery, some of the great people commit great sins. Yeah, 100%. Is choice a factor? Yes. Did some have a baptism and death? Yeah. And yes, correct. Sometimes they had no, like in Nazi Germany, you didn't have any choice. Haman, you didn't have any choice. But generally, I think, I'm not the expert here, as, uh, but for sure in Spain, they had a choice, obviously. But I think generally the Jews did have a choice. They could adopt Christianity. The Goyim weren't that, uh, they weren't killed. It wasn't racial. That's modern anti-Semitism. It wasn't racial anti-Semitism. Yes. It was ideological anti-Semitism, racial anti-Semitism, the invention of the modern period. So uh, what's your, I never heard of her, Whoopi Goldberg. I, I don't know. She sounds, you know, you know, Jewish. I, I don't know what's going on. So she just went two weeks because she said the Holocaust wasn't great. So I'm not uh, up on TV. And, but um, anyways, I'm up on sports a little bit, you know, but not on TV. But anyway, so um, um, yeah, generally Jews did have a choice. They did have a choice to baptize. And that's the Muranos and not, not, but uh, sometimes not. I think the peak was in the 60s and 70s, right? I assume you're talking on Bali Chuba, right? After the Six-Day War, the idealism, right? It's different. It's, uh, you know, everybody thought the Six-Day World, the Mashiach is coming, everything great. We see, uh, without getting into your political views, it's not so simple on the West Bank, Yehuda, Bashar, and everyone calls it. It's not so simple. It's a complex world, and it's not all wonderful. And unfortunately, we see Jewish youth doing terrible things. They, uh, it's not only... Palestinians who commit terrorist acts, unfortunately, as painful that is to say. I'm not equating them. Don't have any accusing of anatomy, but uh, we, 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 we have to worry about ourselves. We have to root out the negativities that we have. Yeah, it's, uh, but in the 60s, it was a 60, I mean, I'm too young really to remember, to remember the aftermath of the Six Day War, but there was a euphoria in the Jewish world that it was be amazing. I assume had a million, as people say, had, had a million American Jews gone on Aliyah. Uh, in 1968, uh, we wouldn't have the problems we have today. It would be a lot different, right? Everybody, you know, what, what happened? You know what Dakota looked like on June the 5th or June the 6th, 1967. You know, like in the Arab Shuk, the, the walls went, the houses went mamash 10 feet up to the Koto. And in one week, between Yom Yerushalayim and, Sh and Shavuos, the Israeli bulldozers came in. And created what we have now as the cult of anybody know that? Nobody knows it. Nobody cares. Okay. So everybody understood that. After the Six Day War, we could have mass I'm, I'm, God forbid, we could have massacred all the Arabs. And uh, and then the world wouldn't have said a word because uh, they were going to massacre us. But but now it knocks down one house and uh, whatever, the world goes crazy. It's a different world. What we could have done in 67, we can't do anymore. And again, I'm not saying this politically. I, I, maybe I am, but I, 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 I don't mean it in that sense. It's a different world. So that, and what happens in the real world affects the religious world. That's uh, so what happens there. So the Balchuva movement, right? Judaism today is not seen as so moral. I mean, we were just accused by Amni and that's being a part that said, of course, we can say it's terrible and awful, and but it, it doesn't matter. That's what people are talking about. So people who are not who assume, Jews on college campuses, you know, who are joining all these very left-wing anti-Israel BDS and stuff, not the, you know, small percentage. Why is that? Because the world has changed. It's a different world. They, they, those same Jews in 1970 weren't like that. So yes, you have to take advantage of historical suggestions. That's my analysis. You can tell me to shut up if you think I'm wrong. But um, anyways, that's um, okay. Does the Rambam give examples 
of um, Chilul Hashem that involve non-Jews. Yeah, we'll pick up on that, please, God, next week. I said the ethical aspect of that. But you see the Rambam, they do involve non-Jews. I think traditionally Shiva direct uh, private message is turning off too many young people. That's not for now. Um, yes, this way or the highway. That That is true. People, I, I, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, although I will say, I think overall the yeshiva world is better on maintaining our kids in the, I'll say me, we in the Wadden Orthodox world. I think they, for better or for worse, I, mean, for, I guess it's better. I think overall the statistics are that more people in the modern Orthodox world go off there. Maybe that's the price you have to pay. Maybe, and maybe they just, play the part because uh, they can't leave it's much harder for them to leave whatever it is so so there are lots of factors and that's maybe I, another time maybe we'll get mark trencher back and we can talk about why people leave judaism i have to book off the derek way the first one uh what's your name marco lees or something she was the first one to write a book on the subject why people become about 15 20 years ago why people become non-observant and you know in the Balshuva movement today uh, they are there. Many of the second generation Bali Chuba are become not, I don't know what the numbers are, but these are phenomena that is concerning to people in the Bali Chuba movement that the children of Bali Chuba are becoming not religious, which is totally not surprising. I mean, if you think about it logically, for mm -hmm. all kinds of reasons, not frightening. One of the basic reasons is, well, dad, mom, you didn't do what your parents do. So I'm like you, I follow your path. I pick a different, I pick my own. That's not a, I don't mean that as, as a joke. And obviously mm -hmm. you don't have grandparents. It's a whole different thing. So it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody wants to say, okay, um, we may not consider those who gave murderers idol worshipers correct, but if they violate Kiddush Hashem, it is a terrible sin. No, the Rambam in Hilchot Shuva says Chilul Hashem is a terrible sin. That's not the same as not doing Kiddush Hashem. Yes, doing Kiddush Hashem is a great mitzvah. It's a great mitzvah to give up your life rather than to do idolatry. But if you don't, we don't consider you like you lose your share in the world to come. There's no truth. No, no, no. That's for doing a Chilul Hashem, like a real Chilul Hashem. That I, I think, I, I'm pretty sure, and I, I, I'll re-look into it, but I, I think, yes, the, that's um, and, and a certain sense, the, and the Rambam doesn't say harizem michalela Hashem. If you look in Hilchot, what well, we did Hilchot Yisrael Torah, the Rambam says he wasn't mikdash Hashem. The Jew who worshipped idols and didn't give up his life didn't fulfill the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem. He doesn't say he, he did a chilul Hashem. It's fascinating. I think I'll look at it again because that because the, we can't blame him so much. What do you want? The guy we don't. He's, he's still, still still in earnest. I'm sorry. He's still an onus. Right, it's an onus. That's exactly right. He's forced to do it. So it's not a chilul Hashem. It's, uh, Kid Hashem is a great oh. mitzvah, but that's not, the Rambam we'll talk about next, what a chilul Hashem is, that's what we'll get to next week. What we discussed this week is what isn't a Kid Hashem. It's not the same thing. It's like on, on Cholamoid. Cholamoid, you can't work, but if it's a davar ha'aveh. The, right, so it's in economics, the difference between making money and opportunity costs. Opportunity costs is money I could have made. So that's not allowed. I, I can't work because I could have made money. If I'm going to get fired, if I don't work, I can work. There, there, even though in theory, right, there we the halakha distinguishes what we call in economics an opportunity cost and a real loss in money. So it's the same type of thing. You have a, a lack of kiddush Hashem doesn't necessarily mean a chilul Hashem. Okay, some say, I don't know, I'm not sure what that means. Blessed is the one who makes his name sanctified. Right, so it's, we're blessing God. Oh, God sanctifies his own name, right? Sanctifies is your name. Okay, thank you. I see, I didn't realize people were typing it in. Thank you. The more it's publicized, the greatest the sanctification. That's for sure true. And the Rambam, the Rabim, I didn't dwell on that, but correct. Um, yeah, the more people, the greater the Kiddush Hashem or the greater the, the Chilul Hashem, God forbid. When Hashem will save us, his name will be sanctified, correct? That's what we spoke about, I think, a fair bit. It gives us the opportunity. What the opportunity is sanctified. Oh, we're thanking God for giving us the opportunity to, to sanctify. Again, that's very interesting. Yeah. I don't know if that's what exactly it means, but blessed is God. Who's, you know, how does he, we have to sanctify his name, but in a sense, we're thanking God for giving us the opportunity for the privilege mm -hmm. of being a Jewish. Okay, right. very good. Yes. Why don't I say it? Because what can I tell you? I, I, I told you. Because <laughs> I never said it. I never brought up that way. Like I, 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 I told you, I brought up me eating trafe. I probably wouldn't keep kosher because I brought up never in my life. I, I never, I, I've never in my life heard anybody explain this paragraph. I've never heard a sheer. I've never heard anybody refer to this paragraph in my whole life. Never. 
doesn't it doesn't mean anything. I just I and I and the Chaz never said it out loud. I've never in my life been to a show where the you know they say the last paragraph, Baruch Hamakadeshim of Rim. So I've never been that the next paragraph the Chaz say Kiyata always only the Chaz mekolam machadars. I've I've never heard that in my life. I will hear by the Baruch Shem Moshe Limor by Sitik Yor Nechosha. They'll go straight to Kabbalas or Rabbi Shmuelim or, or Ezra Mekoman. That you will hear the Chaz say, but you, I've never heard a Chaz say that. Doesn't mean anything. Maybe I go to the wrong shuls. I don't know. Vatican recognized Israel in 1993, right? Because I'm not sure in what reference, but it, it took them a long time to recognize Israel because uh, the Jew is supposed to be wandering Jew. How could that be? Okay. Um, the four corners. Somebody asked me to do a, a thing where all the four corners are mentioned. So it is metaphorical, even though it's there is no doubt that during the Talmudic period, uh, many of the rabbis of the Talmud did not know the world was round. I, I think knowledge that the world was round did exist in time of time, but it, it seems pretty clear from a few Talmudic passages that not all the rabbis were aware of that. That's fine. That's this other argument, you know, the rabbis have infallible knowledge of science. So I come from the world where that's not true. And Rav Shachter would tell us that all the time. The rabbis weren't scientists. They, they knew. They knew what they had to know. And some, like like today, some rabbis are are worldly and some rabbis have no interest in the world. Some rabbis today don't know all the fate about what goes on in the world. So it's probably not so different, but the Gemara has a whole discussion what does the sun do at night? I'm wondering what does the sun do at night? Because you know the earth is flat, and the, where, where does the sun go? It moves from east to west, and that's where Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said the 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 non-Jew scientists say A. That's a Gemara Imsachim Sadik Dalek, ninety four A, ninety four B Imsachim. The non-Jews say A, and the Jews say B, and the non-Jews are right. The the non-Jew explanation. The Jews they were busy learning Gemara. They didn't know all the signs. Yeah, so um, so I don't know when they say the four corners of the earth, I think they mean it metaphorically, but maybe for some they meant it literally too. Okay, how do we connect the sources with a book like not in the name of God and the book of morality? I'm not sure what their question is, Tova. Not in the name of God is Jonathan Sachs's book, I think, which I have not read about the. Uh, not- Both have done the sense. Both have. The, right. well, the, Rabbi the morality Rabbi book, Sachs. I've read a lot of it, right. And he refers to the Shem Hashem, the Kiddush Hashem. Right. Uh, the Jonathan Kedul Sachs Hashem was the one the who epitomized this more than any rabbi. Jonathan Sachs had the most universalistic, you know, approach. Even Norman Lamb, who, you know, I'm just reading through the 300-page thing in tradition, they put out the memorial volume to him. Norman Lamb was a great, great leader, but his focus was more internal. Toromada, of course, building Yeshiva University, all that stuff. But his and his focus was on Jewish movement. Jonathan Sachs had a much more this worldly vision by Eolam, sanctifying God's name. I mean, that you know, he was probably more popular with the Nazis. He was on the BBC and the Queen of England and then and Thatcher. Uh, I know with some with, with Thatcher so much, you know, but uh, you know, he was very uh, popular. He was viewed in the non-Jewish world, you know, a, a, as a, a deep thinker, one of the leading intellectual thinkers in England, and therefore his writings were very much like that. There was analysis. I think somebody wrote an article in their house. You know, earlier in his career, Jonathan Sachs was writing books for the Jewish community. And then later on, he wrote really a lot of books where the main target and it's morality. It's, of course, it's taking Jewish things, but he's writing to the world. He's not writing only to Jews. And he's for sure not writing to Orthodox Jews. I mean, he's also writing to Orthodox Jews, but he's not focusing. His sitter, yeah, beautiful, beautiful introduction. You got to read it. The best introduction there is on the sitter, Jonathan Sachs's in- introduction. That's for a traditional audience. But with Jonathan Sachs, I'm much broader vision so i i haven't read not in my game name I, i've read most of morality yeah this is what he talks about being ethical okay uh it's you're you're lucky or unlucky that i'm not teaching in chat today we had the day off otherwise i would have had to leave so i'm staying awesome. i don't know if you like it or don't but uh whatever <laughs> side by side related point that somebody sent me a, a private message to the prophets who were lesser than moses God dictated the word or implanted ideas. Okay, that has to do with how the prophecy of Moshe was qualitatively different than other people. I don't, we're not going to talk about that now. Um, Safari, I don't know what your Rabbi Carmi, I don't know what that's referring to. The sources, tradition online, Okodo Dito Fake at 50. Okay, very good. Yeah, that's probably, oh, that's the source of Nathan Rosen. I think who's not here uh, yet, but thank you for uh, still posting. Uh, I assume the links to Kodo Dito Fake, right? It is in English. He of course gave it in Yiddish. The, the Rav gave Kodo Dito Fake in Yiddish, so you might as well read it in English. I mean, if he spoke it in Hebrew, okay, so you can read it in the original. But you're not reading in the original in Hebrew. I've I've only read it in English. Uh, the Six Day War is a big impetus for the Chuban and Soviet Jewry. Correct. We talked about Chuban and the Soviet Jewry movement, hundred percent. 
Um, a lot of conversions, somebody saying privately are only done for um, intermarrying. Okay, to marry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a whole other issue. Uh, that's what's going on with Big Friday night today. Yeah. Um, okay, the stage, somebody asked me to connect to last night. Okay, so I'll have to ask him prior, afterwards. Um, notion of Shekhinah, the feminine force. So everybody just send me private messages. Jews were exiled because they didn't keep the Torah. It's a kid is a shame that the Jews are being returned to Israel. Right? But if they don't keep the Torah, what was the purpose of the exile? I would say if they don't keep the Torah, that's what was the purpose of the exile. What's the purpose of being back in Israel? But uh, we do keep the Torah. We do, we do kid is a shame. That's okay. We, that's a lot to talk about on that subject. Right. That, by the way, that's why the traditional world, much of the Orthodox world was very opposed to Zionism because they say it's worse. It's one thing to sin in America. But if you're going to sin in Israel, you're sinning in God's home, you're coming back, that's even worse. Why, why do you think there's so much Orthodox anti-Zionism uh, for that exact reason? But I would argue, uh, look on the facts on the ground. Look at how many Jews became, look, look at even the non-religious Jews in Israel today. They, they speak, they, you know, 90% fast on Yom Kippur. I, I think about 50 to 60% of Israelis Jews keep kosher and they don't call themselves religious. Like you'll ask... 30% identify as religious, way higher than outside of Israel. And then they say, are you religious or do you keep kosher? 50, 60% will say, yeah. So I'm, I'm not religious. I, I, you know, I, I drive on Shabbos. I, 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 don't, I don't put on fill-in every day. But I, of course, I keep kosher. I'm, I'm Jewish. Like, like here, you know, of course, I fast on Yom Kippur. I'm not religious, but I fast on Yom Kippur. So in Israel, the person says, I'm not religious, but I keep kosher. In America, if you keep kosher, you're like, an, you know, a religious Jew. Mm -hmm. you know, that's so much. The Torah, the, I don't think you can make those arguments anymore that, you know, the sinning is worse. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, Jews coming together. We're, we're, we're not perfect, we, but it's, it's Labadik. We're doing amazing things. There's tremendous Kiddush Hashem, tremendous, tremendous. And some Chilul Hashem too, unfortunately. So we got to work on that. But yes, that, that's ultimately, we want us to keep the Torah in Israel. But remember, the Torah is very broad. <clears throat> when Israel helps Africa with water technology, that's a Kiddush Hashem. That's a mitzvah. Don't think of it in the narrow religious sense. Think of it in the broader sense of all the help Israel does. Okay. Respectful. Thank you. <clears throat> we are observing Kiddush when Israel just oh, bring medical. Oh, that's, I didn't see that. Exactly. Exactly. When they bring uh, medical assistance, great kiddush Hashem. Okay, I think that's it. Lots of comments. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, that's can I, okay. Can I say? Can I say yeah. one thing? Sure. Um, yeah, that that um, paragraph, Atra, who I don't know, right. the one that you're talking about. Right. Um, I, again, I I don't say the whole thing, but I say part of it. Good. Me the first More than I say. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But it's the first, uh, the first section of it to be again. I find it that it grounds me, it focuses me. Yeah, the, the uh, sinner is meant you know, to focus. Yeah. Absolutely, no. Yeah, as you're actually, I'm actually, say, I'm actually saying it is. You know, you are the first, and you are the last, and that, and and to me, that's that's very powerful, and it gets me into that frame of understanding that the, I am, uh, you know. Yeah, I'm dabbing to you, Hashem. I'm I'm acknowledging that you're Hashem. And that for me, that's I find it very powerful. Okay. Okay, thank you. Joseph, I apologize. I I, I um, feel free to rebut what I said. I, I I hear what you're saying. You're saying I, I try not to speak politically in a certain sense. I did okay. What okay. I I I, I don't mean it in terms of any political. I okay, I don't whatever maybe i'll get myself more in trouble but i i'm trying to make the comments from an ethical moral perspective regardless of what your political view whether you're right wing left wing in favor of settlements not in favor i, I don't think that's the issue if uh if people are doing violence to other people it, I, it, the it, it has nothing to do with what your view is. you can believe we should annex yehuda bishamron i can hear that view uh, that's not the issue here i i think but uh, if you're Feel free to please uh, rebut what I said, or that's fine. And I do appreciate your comment, and I, I will try to avoid it. Sometimes I maybe cross the line. So what can I say? Okay, any other comments or uh, questions? Just, yeah, just from this, uh, whatever, from the, uh, 
you mentioned was last week you said it was Franca who didn't know was Jewish. Today you said Roger Maris. Which one? Oh, was you're that? right. I made a mistake. It was Franca. Yeah, okay. I, I corrected her. You should have corrected me. Yes, yes, yes. As far okay. as you know, Roger Maris. You know what? Because I was talking to Chaim Klein yesterday in school. We were talking uh, to Sandy Koufax. It was the last day of the quad. We we're talking about, you know, uh, I asked the kids if they all know who Sandy Koufax and playing on Yom Kippur. So he mentioned Roger Maris in the whole discussion. We, he was talking about Hank Greenberg. Hank Greenberg also didn't play on Yom Kippur. We're saying today all the Jewish mm -hmm. athletes play on Yom Kippur. It's true. All the Jewish athletes yeah. I know of play on Yom Kippur. Yes, including your chat graduate. I know, I know, I know, I know. And, yeah. uh, and um, but um, Sean Green, who was an outfielder for the Blue Jays about 20 years ago, played, didn't play Kol Nidre night, but he played Yom Kippur day. So that was like the, the, mm. the transition. So no, we, Chaim Klein, who, who teaches with me a chat, whatever, he's a great guy. So he was. It's, uh, he teaches the period of before I teach. So we some we overlap. We sometimes we schmooze together with the class. So he was saying, why? Why is it? Why? Why did Sandy Koufax not pitch on the World Series on Yom Kippur? And some guy plays a hockey game like in October, which is a meaningless hockey game on Yom Kippur. Like so, it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, it also has to do with the. I don't know, it's, it is an interesting thing. I, I don't have a simple answer to that question, but it does have to do with more of a connection. Jews 50 years ago, in many ways, they, they weren't religious, but they had grandparents who were religious. I don't know. I don't know if anybody has any ideas. It's a hard thing to say. Okay. Thank you, Rosalind. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, we went really over time. I thank those who, uh, who stayed. Have next. a wonderful Shabbos. Okay. Yes. Okay. I saw an article where I, I don't know where I read it, but it was saying 72% of, um, um, what is that, non observant or, or I don't know, I think it's a non observant. The Pew report, Jews. I said, you're talking about, I think the Pew report said that I think 2% of conservative Jews become Orthodox. I think that's oh, okay. I, I, was saying, I think 1% was saying, of reform. But yeah. it's probably 0.1% point, point of the people who are unaffiliated, 0.001%. Yeah. Like, I think you know, that's that's, and, and then of the Orthodox who become non-Orthodox, of course, it's much higher. Now, people were, you know, 20 years tapping the banks on the back, oh, Balchuba, something about Chuba. Yeah, Balchuba can pale in comparison to the people who leave Orthodoxy. They're way yeah. more. But, but I think yeah. it was in, um 72% of non-Jewish, um, non-observant Jews um, were assimilating. That's the one I read. Um, way more similar. I mean, it depends how you define in America. In America, you know? in America. assimilation is not so easy to define. You know, somebody's yeah. married to a non-Jew, but they they are proud to be Jews and they light a Hanukkah menorah, even if they have a Christmas tree. And it's not so easy always to define what's assimilated. I mean, I, I, I get that's maybe not. Oh, you know, it, it's not so simple. I mean. No. You know, um, that's pretty. That's pretty high, though. I, I'm very surprised that. Uh, I mean, listen, seventy so percent of non-Orthodox Jews intermarry. You know, now over seventy percent. So in the non-Orthodox world, they're intermarrying. But today, you have many Jews who intermarry. It's not uh, not considered. So you know, it's what I do. Whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not. Uh, so it's 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 a complicated life. Is complex. What can I tell you? But, but I think, uh, but, but I think you were saying like the the, the Shiva world, um, really are um the you know the, the kids are staying in right because they're strengthening the more more i think so yeah yeah they, they're they're stronger yeah they're yeah, yeah they, they stay more that that's why some people want to be part of that world they're more insular and they're successful i seem to be more successful at keeping their kids i don't know all right wish everybody shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom. Uh, be well thank you everybody okay bye-bye all right shalom. Shalom. bye bye